Hey there art nerds, I'm really excited to share this watercolor tutorial with you guys today because I'm really pleased with how it turned out. We're really going to be focusing on glow techniques. We've got a couple of different types of glow going on in this illustration and I'm really looking forward to showing you guys my tips and tricks for achieving glow effects in your watercolor illustrations. So grab your paint, grab your paper, and let's get to painting. So we're starting off with a penciled watercolor illustration that was originally blue line printed onto Saunders cotton rag watercolor paper. And you want to work with a cotton rag paper because it's going to be able to handle a lot of water and it's also going to be able to handle a lot of paint and a lot of pigments. I find that cellulose papers don't quite handle this many layers and this sort of soft gradual buildup of color the way a cotton rag paper can. Now Saunders has a lot of sizing to it. It can be a great watercolor paper but it can also be a little bit temperamental and a little bit finicky. We're starting out by stretching this paper onto a piece of plastic gator board. It's also known as Coroplast. It's basically a plastic version of foam core and you can use it over and over and over over again. I've been using the same two sheets cut down the size for about 10 years now. So it really does last a long time and it's worth the investment of tracking it down. You guys might recognize it from yard signs and political signs. So if you happen to have any of those about, clean them off and you can use them to stretch your watercolor paper. I also used low tack blue masking tape. I like to use 3M's crepe painters tape. Now I'm going to be doing a little bit of masking and for that I've got my handy dandy masking fluid. I've put my masking fluid into a smaller container, a dinky dip. This is going to help preserve my masking fluid and it's going to keep it from spoiling and it's much more manageable than dipping it into the bottle. I've gone ahead and I've applied some brush soap to a synthetic watercolor brush. The brush soap helps preserve the bristles. It keeps the masking fluid from soaking up into the ferrule and ruining your brush. But just to be safe, I would highly recommend you don't ever use a brush you absolutely love especially not a natural hair or a mixed fiber watercolor brush to apply masking fluid to your watercolor illustrations I mean eh, the the brush soap does help preserve it it does help prevent it from becoming ruined but it's not a hundred percent guarantee so when I do these sort of walkthroughs and tutorials I don't necessarily like telling you guys exactly what paints I'm using for what because everybody has a different palette and I don't expect you to work with the same palette that I have so I am using a lot of really light greens some fairly opaque watercolors and some yellows for our glow effects I applied my masking fluid to the areas that I want to be the brightest so the mushrooms that are going to be closest to the viewer as well as the center of the lantern that Kara is holding I'm going to go back in later on and add my brightest colors there after I've kind of established everything and I blended my colors out and working wet into wet or at least as wet into wet as possible I'm now applying a toning wash of I think it's um undersea green which is a Daniel Smith color so it's a, a mix of colors but lots of different brands have a similar color like Aquarius green is a similar color that mixed with some indigo and probably some neutral tint to start toning the background and also kind of doing a grise underpainting so that's basically where I'm going to start painting in my shadows I'm going to start creating the glow effect by painting the shadows and blending them back out so a lot of painting light involves painting darkness creating that contrast because you can never tell how bright something is if you can't see the sort of dark shadows it creates so in this instance I'm using that same mixed color that dark grayish color to paint the skin the hair basic ever basically everything that would have been cast in shadow by our light sources. And I love painting light sources, especially when I have really strong direct light sources. It's very easy to tell where the light would be hitting. But if you struggle to paint light sources, it's really important to keep in mind that even though we're painting on a 2D plane, we're painting 3D objects. And to try to reduce them to the most basic form of 3D objects that they are. So the most basic form for a branch would be a cylinder. The most 
most basic form for most people's torsos would be a cylinder and use that as your guide as you try to wrap the light and the shadow around your forms and i have tutorials here on the channel where i show you guys how to paint and how to marker basic facial constructions 3d volumetric forms of faces using alcohol markers and using watercolors so that's understanding light and contrast i also have a series where i show you guys how to create light and contrast using basic 3d volumetric forms using watercolor that's part of my watercolor basics series so i'll be sure to link that for you guys i hope you guys will check it out my goal here is to provide as many of the tools and tutorials that you guys need so that you guys have confidence in trying out watercolor experimenting with watercolor and trying out new things so that that includes very basic tutorials, that includes intermediate tutorials, that includes more advanced tutorials, it includes product reviews as well because y'all, I love watercolor. I'm a watercolor illustrator, but I also love teaching and I want to make art something that everyone finds accessible, that can be part of anyone's life, whether it's art as a hobby, art for enjoyment, art to communicate, or art as a profession. I think art should be part of everyone's lives. So as that first layer dried, I'm going in with a much stronger mix of the same color and I'm doing it wet into wet so we get those diffused blends. And in areas where it's kind of dried, I may leave those crisp outlines where the shadow is more defined and it's more of a cast shadow. Um, or I may blend it out and that's going to create more of like the form is turning away from the light rather than another object is blocking the light from hitting the form behind it. I'm also starting to carve out some of the shapes in the mushrooms using that same shadow color. So those of you who have watched several of my watercolor tutorials probably recognize the grise technique. You don't have to do it with grays. You can do it with whatever toning color you want. And it can be a great way to define shadows early on and use that as a guide when you're adding your color later on. So I sometimes use it very early in the painting. Sometimes I go back and I add it again later on. It really kind of depends on the needs of the painting and your needs as an artist, the kind of art that you guys create. So as you guys can see, I have a very cartoony illustrator style. A lot of my work is influenced and inspired by my work as a comic artist. I make the web comic 7-inch Kara. I hope you guys will read it. It's all in watercolor and you can read it at 7inchkara.com. If you're more a fan of the dead tree format like myself, if you love to read to your little ones, your nieces, your nephews, your kids, your grandkids, your friends' kids, or if you yourself are a younger reader and you still prefer books, I know I love books, you can order volume 1 and volume Volume 2 out of my online shop at natasoup.com slash shop. I'll make sure to have all of that list linked for you guys down in the description below, as well as a list of other relevant helpful tutorials and um, other ways that you guys can find me, whether it's on Instagram, Patreon, Twitter, whatever. So please check the description. So now that I've got my darkest darks, my shadows more established, I'm going in now and I'm reestablishing my lights and my light sources and how they cast light on the objects in the image. So you guys can see I'm adding a more watered down yellow like it's a glow to Kara, to her shirt, to her torso, to her face, to her eyes, but I'm also adding it to the environment that they're inhabiting. And I'm gonna do the same thing with the green. And that's creating a more believable, inhabited environment, a place she is within that environment. That's one of my goals. Sometimes when it comes to illustration, your characters don't always match the environment you've created and one of the ways you can kind of help marry the two is by your color choices and using some of the same colors and having cast color affecting the local color so local color is the color that objects seem to be to the eye under normal sunshine lighting conditions cast color is any other color they might appear so if you're sitting in the grass it might cast cool green light 
back up onto your leg, making your legs look a little bit more yellow than they might if you were standing in full sunlight. Or if you are standing in the ocean and the water appears to be blue, it's reflecting a blue wavelength. We know that water isn't actually, actually blue, but you're standing in the water, it might make your legs look more greenish. So that's what I mean by cast color and local color. And that's something that can be really fun to play around with if you are an illustrator or an artist. How much do you wanna affect the local color? How much do you wanna change it for the mood, for the feel, for the atmosphere of the piece? And as a comic artist, I'm also a storyteller. So I'm always thinking about ways to kind of push that story, to kind of push the narrative and make it feel more like a piece that you can kind of escape into. That's one of my big goals when I'm creating illustrated pieces like this. So now that I have my light fairly established and my shadow fairly established, I'm going in and I'm actually starting to paint my local color. And I am using a really dark brown mix that includes Van Dyke brown and sepia to start painting the, these are actually roots. She's in an underground cavern. So I'm using that to paint the roots that are around her. But I also want to maintain kind of that glow effect. I don't want to lose the lighting that we've worked really hard to establish. Now we could leave it in this kind of green, grise, and yellow, because if you're in a low light environment, everything seems to be a little bit darker, a little bit cooler, a lot grayer. It's harder for our eyes to perceive color in low light environments like this, unless the object creating the light, like fireworks or a lantern or glowing mushrooms are a particular color. So we could go more realistic in that regard, and that would also help push the story. It would help create that environment where we have this low color, low chroma environment. Um, I did try to, I didn't make things as saturated as I would if she were in a full light environment, but I did render in some local color as you guys will see as we progress. But I'm basically kind of working um, I did have an idea for the color palette that I wanted to use for her, but I wanted to kind of render everything else in case seeing those colors changed my perception of how I wanted to apply the color to her. And you guys can see, I did a lot of monochromatic rendering on Kara. A lot of the form and the value are already established. I could go in and just do a light wash of each local color. So in the background, I also dabbed in some of Daniel Smith's Lunar Black. So this includes PBK11, which is a super granulating black pigment. I thought that would add a lot of grit and visual interest to the dark. It would help create this sort of glow effect. It would help create this kind of all-encompassing darkness that only the glowing mushrooms and only the lantern are kind of keeping at bay. I also applied a fair amount of masking fluid to the lantern. She's holding a metal star-shaped lantern that has a lot of holes in it. So in that instance, it's actually easiest to apply masking fluid to, if you wish. You can also allow the light to see through to apply the masking fluid to the metal mesh parts and then remove that after you've painted the glowing light and then go in and paint whatever color metal you want. So creating this believable environment, this believable light source was really important to me. And that's where I spent a lot of the time with this painting, creating those shadows, creating that light source, creating that sense of depth. And it was only once I felt like I'd really done a good job establishing that, that I started adding in the local color. So I want you guys to pay attention to the tree roots. I've tried to kind of gradiate the color and create a glow effect by not having as many layers, not having the color as saturated, our local brown color as saturated as it nears the light sources itself. So you guys can see how near the mushrooms, it's actually a much softer version. And there's a lot of that glowy green 
with the brown. So it's really influenced the brown. And we've done that by just building up layers. I didn't mix the green and brown. That would not have given me the color I wanted. I achieved that by doing multiple layers and multiple applications. I've also removed a lot of that interior green from the center of our front and foremost mushrooms. And I've gone ahead and started painting that. And even if something is emitting light, even if something is glowing, you can still create areas of shadow. You can still create areas of contrast. It's up to you though. You may decide you just want it to be this bright, intense light that's one color or two colors. It really depends on what kind of story you're trying to tell and what you're trying to create with this piece. I wanted the mushrooms to be decipherable as mushrooms. I wanted there to be a sense of depth. I wanted it to seem like she's in the middle of this environment. So to do that, I used developing contrast and adding in shadow to help better establish that. So some illustrators have very simple art styles where they only need one or two or three layers to establish what they're going for. And some illustrators need weeks to paint what they want to paint. Both are totally valid. I fall somewhere in the middle and sometimes I feel like my work is a little overly rendered, but I have to admit I am a huge fan of more cartoony art styles that tend to have these really lush, beautifully rendered, beautifully detailed backgrounds, environments, clothing, set pieces. So illustrations where the faces are very simple, but everything else is kind of realistic and fairly detailed. I'm a big fan of Naoki Urasawa's work. I'm a big fan of Yotsubato. I'm a big fan of even Vinland Saga. So those kind of art styles where you have a more simplified way of drawing faces so that they can go big, cartoony, expressive if you want, but the environment feels more rendered and more realistic. That's one of my goals as an artist. So that's one of the reasons I put so much time into painting and rendering and trying to figure things out. And I will also frequently work really heavily from reference. In this instance, not so much. Most of the reference came from me referencing the lantern. So it's actually um, kind of a three-dimensional chunky locket that has a large interior space where I had hoped to put an LED light, but I haven't gotten around to figuring out how I would do that. So that's what kind of inspired this whole piece. That seemed like something Kara would pop a couple of fireflies into and take with her when she's out exploring and out adventuring. Originally, when I was sketching this though, I was heavily inspired by male Mori Key fashion. So Mori Key is like girl of the forest or forest aesthetic. And I wanted to reference fashions that are more typically worn by guys who are dressing in that style because for Kara that would be a more practical look. I'm also a big fan of dressing my characters practically based on their personalities and the environment they're in. So once everything had a chance to dry I used a masking fluid pickup to pick up some of the masking fluid from the illustration. I also used a spritzer bottle full of clean water to get some of these colors to meld better to get some of these colors to flow. So one of my complaints with masking fluid is that it has a tendency to preserve areas a little too pristinely. They're very clean edges. They can feel a little too cartoony for me. So I like using a little bit of clean water to just kind of get some of those colors to move and to get some of those colors to flow. And then it starts to feel a little bit more natural and a little bit more organic. So if I, if just for me, this is just my personal taste. This is not about any other digital artist, but when I work digitally, I work very cleanly. And that's one of the things I like about traditional media is that you can get really messy and have a lot of fun with it. And that's one of the ways it just kind of lends itself. So for me, when I'm working traditionally, I don't want it to look like my digital art and vice versa. I try to keep them as a very distinct thing. So we spent a lot of time working on and developing the environment working and developing the glow effects, working and developing the shadows and the lighting before we ever started putting in any of the local color for Kara. And all this buildup is going to make adding in the local color very easy. Um, this is an established character of mine. So she's like one of two main characters in my comic. So I definitely know 
what she looks like, what color she likes to wear, what color combinations she likes to wear. So it's really just a matter of selecting from those what will work best in this environment what is she most likely to wear in this environment because it's about storytelling and it's about staying within the character so for me when i create illustrations it's wonderful to be able to create a beautiful illustration that people like but for me there has to be more to it it has to be right for those characters right for their personalities it has to feel like a choice they made and not just a choice that I made as the illustrator so for the glow effects on her sweater I did it a couple of different ways I feathered in the color and then I also blended it out and then while it's still wet I'm also adding in a darker version of that color particularly as we move away from our light source because my goal is to create the sort of soft glow you get when light is reflecting bouncing off a of fabric because fabric will absorb a lot of that but it doesn't absorb all of it and you're still going to get some areas where you have lighter color in the fabric areas where you have some of the color from the light source and you're of course going to have your areas of shadow it's just not going to be as striking as if it were like a more metallic or a more shiny or a harder object So y'all can probably see why it was important for me to go with a really absorbent cotton rag paper, especially one that has a lot of internal sizing. So I work with a lot of different watercolor papers. They Different papers serve different needs. So with Saunders, it has a lot of sizing, both internal and external. Now, some papers that have a lot of external papers, like Windsor & Newton's cotton rag paper for a while had a lot of sizing, and it has kind of a soapy feel that some artists don't like. Saunders feels a lot like painting on cardboard, but in a good way. I don't know how to express it to people who haven't painted on it before, but it has a lot of internal sizing, a lot of internal structure. So the paper itself isn't gonna get kind of pulpy it's not going to start to be like painting on toilet paper it's going to really hold up to a lot of layers a lot of wet into wet a lot of working so if you like working with water saunders can be a great paper for you conversely stonehenge aqua cold press and shizen hot press and cold press have less sizing so when you add a lot of water while they're still very wet they can get kind of pulpy it can be difficult to tell how the finished piece might look because when they're wet, 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 wet like that, they look very different from how they're gonna look when they dry and they kind of tighten up. So Saunders is remains kind of tight. The fibers are kind of tightly packed the whole time you're working on it. It's not as forgiving a paper as say Arches when you've got a good batch of Arches or Moulin de Roy, but it's even though it has its own quirks it's still a good paper and in this instance it's a great paper and it was exactly what I wanted so one of the things that I would love to encourage more artists to do is don't just use the things you're familiar with you're comfortable with you're happy with over and over and over again I really really want to encourage you guys to try different products to try things you've never tried before to try different fibers even even if you think you might not like it just the act of trying experimenting playing around with it can really give you new options it can give you fresh inspiration it can give you fresh insight and that's one of the things that even though I am not a popular art supply reviewer by any shakes here on YouTube I think I'm probably like the bottom one okay I still love reviewing art supplies because getting to play with or going out and purchasing and trying out all these other products and sending samples to my friends and sharing samples with my students, it really gives me 
a opportunity to try all these things that I would not have tried before. My undergrad education was very focused on digital media and very focused on the materials the teachers thought we should use with not a lot of encouragement to go out and try something wild or try something different. It was a very rigid environment for learning that didn't really invite a lot of player exploration and I'm a very playful person. And then while I was at SCAD, while they did encourage us to experiment and try new things, there wasn't a lot of support in the CEQA department at that time for artists with more illustration leaning. It was just the departments were divided at the time and it was not always the easiest to take classes in both departments as a grad student because you just didn't have time in your schedule for both necessarily. And they didn't bring in teachers from one department to teach in the other all that frequently. But I was fortunate enough to have friends who did have a background in illustration, whereas my background was in printmaking and in digital media. They were able to teach me a lot about watercolor and alcohol markers and color pencils. And I was able to teach them a lot about block printing and linograph. Uh, uh, linoleum printing and intaglio and screen printing and together we were able to work out different digital processes so that we could print our own zines and mini comics affordably so that's one of the reasons I really love playing with different materials and I really love trying out new things even if I don't think they're going to be the best is because both of my formal educations were very rigid and very time constrained and now that I'm self-employed and I'm generating my own work and I'm generating my own leads I am free to an extent to experiment and explore with whatever techniques I find inspiring and whatever materials I find inspiring. And at the best of times, it feels so much like play and it's so inspiring and it's so much fun. And at the worst of times, it's kind of lonely and kind of expensive because one of the best parts of experimenting with different art supplies is being able to share them with other people and being able to try their favorite art supplies out as well and getting to sit down and learn techniques with other artists. So the internet can be wonderful in that we are able to experiment and see how other artists are working and be so inspired by all these different social media platforms where we can see artists across the world sharing what they know and sharing their art with us. But it, all, it can also be incredibly lonely because there's really nothing that beats sitting down with an other artist whose art you like and they like your art and geeking out about your favorite art supplies. And that's one of the things I try really hard to do here on this channel to the best of my ability, whether it's live streams or tutorials or reviews. That's one of the things that I really want to share with you guys. And one of those things I think is so wonderful and I wish I could make it available and accessible to more artists. So I'm not really gonna walk you guys too much through the basic painting process for this one, mainly because I have a lot of tutorials where I walk you guys step by step by step through some of the more basic parts of this. I, in this regard, at this stage, there isn't a whole lot I'm going to do that is just totally breaking the mold and unusual from the way I normally paint. Um, we've done a lot with the glow techniques. We've talked about developing the color. We've talked about grise. We've talked about thinking about light and local color. Now I'm thinking about blocking some of that light, especially on the lantern using Payne's gray. You could also use black because the things that block the light appear the darkest. So if you're thinking about it on a surface level, you might think, oh, it's right by the light, so it's gonna be really well lit. It's going to look really bright. We're really gonna be able to tell what color it is. You're gonna get rim lighting like that, that is really bright on that object, especially with metallic objects. But the center of the thing that is blocking the light is going to be really, really dark. It's gonna be difficult for your eye to perceive what color it is because you're getting all this light blasting around it and it's just going, it's blocking the light. So it's gonna be difficult to tell what color it is. And I really wanted to express that here with the, the lantern. And another really great way to help express that is by having that rim lighting where 
parts of the air, the object that's blocking the light are white or very, very bright, like a very bright version of the local color that that object is. And that express like the light is hitting this at full blast. It's very close to the light source. It's very bright. And then having everything very dark or black or in full shadow. So you have like this high contrast between the area that the light is directly hitting and then the area that is completely blocking the light from the eye. And hopefully that makes sense. It's such a, whenever I'm painting and I'm thinking about these things, I'm actually having a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to think about those kinds of things. To help create the impression of brilliant, radiant light, maybe hitting dust motes in the background, I want to flick some yellow paint in, and that's gonna help break up the background as well. And it's also going to make those darker areas seem darker. So I'm masking off Kara's face, and I'm just going to use a kind of flicking technique. So I'm knocking or hammering on my brush. I'm using a silver black velvet brush here. So it's a mix of natural and synthetic. And generally, if you want this sort of flicking splatter technique, the looser you mix your paint, the easier it is to get these sort of larger splatters, but they're not going to be as saturated. So if you want more saturated splatters, you might wanna move up a brush size work with um, a thicker concentration, a thicker mix of paint to water, and that'll give you the larger splatters because you're working with a larger brush, but it's not going to be as watery and watered down as it dry. But it really kind of depends on what effect you want with this. You can actually kind of build up to that where you have these really light, larger splatters, and then these really saturated, smaller splatters. It kind of depends on what you're going for with your illustration.
So I use Bulldog and binder clips just to help secure the paper to the Coroplast. It's not really 100% intended to keep the tape down. It does help with that, but it also helps keep the paper stretched when I'm doing like really wet into wet washes. But it can get in the way as I'm moving in and I'm doing tighter and smaller details, especially when I'm working at a desk like I am here and I'm recording. It's kind of difficult to hover my arm above and around those clips. So so I'll remove them as we progress with the illustration and as we near completion, especially as I'm doing finer details like with the eyelashes and the eyebrows that you guys can see here. And you can actually see my glasses in the shot because for me, it's important for me to like really get in there and be able to see what I'm doing. And I save this for the end because this is one of the thickest concentrations of paint that I'm going to be applying. If I were to try and do like a shadow glaze on top of it, it would activate that paint and it would start to turn to mud. So if you find that your paintings turn muddy, you might want to think about your order of operations and how early are you going in and trying to paint in fine details, usually saving those for the end. I know it can be hard to wait that long, especially because, you know, when you do paint the eyelashes, when you do paint the highlights in the eyes, when you do paint those smaller details, that's often when the illustration really starts to feel like it's coming together and coming to life. But if you paint those too early, if you get ahead of yourself, it can kind of start to fall apart and turn to mud. And you can turn a painting that was a great painting into a painting that you're really kind of struggling to salvage. So the thing about cotton rag watercolor paper is that while it's still wet, while it's still damp, it can be really hard to use watercolor pencils on it. There are definitely some techniques you can use. I'm not saying it's impossible, but for color adjustment, for adding just a light shade of the color, for doing blend out techniques, it's best, in my opinion, if you wait until the paper has had a chance to dry fully, the fibers have kind of tightened back up, and you get that surface tooth. And Saunders has a pronounced surface tooth that makes it play really nicely with watercolor pencils. Now, I've talked about my favorite watercolor pencils here on the channel. I did a big comparative review of them a while back, and I can link that for you guys if you're curious. But my top favorites are the Karen Dosh Museum Aquarelle, the Derwent Ink Tense, Technically, they're India ink pencils, but you know what? Faber-Castell's Albrecht Durer pencils are also India ink, and we still refer to those as watercolor pencils. In fact, a lot of watercolor pencils actually utilize India ink. So, we can argue about it. Oh man, back when the channel was much younger, anytime I talked about Derwent ink tents, there was always someone who would correct me in the comments to say they're not watercolor pencils. But there's a lot of India ink based products that are sold as watercolor products that many people are not aware are India ink products. So at this point, if it's water soluble, if I use it for my watercolor illustrations, I don't really care all that much. I, I figure there's no need to be that pedantic. But I'm using these watercolor pencils to add in, say, some shadow like you guys can see. I wanted to add a bit of a teal shadow to the mushrooms and then blend it out to just kind of help further that glow and create some more depth. And I'm also using it to add some rim lighting. So that's why I've got some of the yellows and the whites just to kind of add back in that sort of magical feeling rim lighting, especially to the roots because I really want the lighting to hit the roots. And I feel like that got kind of lost, but that's what also helps create this environment, having the lighting actually affect the objects in the environment. And one of the reasons I really like watercolor pencils, and I don't use them for the entirety of a painting, but I will use them at this stage to tweak things and add details and to just slightly shift and fix things, is that you can blend them out using water so you can get really, really saturated tones. You can also get really subtle, almost washes. And of 
course, as with most of my watercolor illustrations, I end up wrapping up by applying some white gouache, which you guys will see me use in just a minute. I really wanted to take the time to add in those white highlights, to add in that rim lighting, and to even add some flex of white gouache around it. First though, I needed to remove any residual masking fluid that might still be on the paper since I splattered that and those teeny tiny little splatters are sometimes easy to miss. So one of my techniques for that is I'll just gently run my finger across the paper, especially in areas where I can't tell if there's masking fluid. And if I feel that slight rubbery resist, then I can use the masking fluid pickup to pick up any leftover remaining masking fluid. So while this illustration took a few days to paint, that's the magic of time lapse. It doesn't take nearly as long to watch as it does to paint. I had a lot of fun kind of relaxing, taking my time and trying to create something that feels magical. That's one of my favorite parts about cartooning and illustration is that you can take the impossible, you can take fantasy and make it just a little bit more real. You can bring it to life by illustrating it. And this is the sort of magic that I hope everyone will someday be able to have whether you want to draw and paint your DD &D characters you want to tell your own stories in comic or animated form or you just enjoy doodling and your doodles bring a smile to somebody else's face all of those are amazing and valid and deserve to exist. So I will continue to share what I know about drawing and painting and using markers in the hopes that I can inspire more people to give art a try and to make art a habit. So I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial because I enjoyed sharing it with you guys. It's always a pleasure for me to share my art with y'all. If you'd like to see more of my art, it'd really mean a lot to me if you read my comic, 7-Inch Kara. Like I said earlier, you can read it for free or if you purchase it from the shop, that does help me continue to make videos like this one. You can also see more of my art and support tutorials like this one by joining me over on Patreon. This tutorial was only made possible thanks to their generosity and support. And you can find out more information about that down in the description below. But I do have a thank you screen where I thank my amazing patrons for their help and support over the years. It really means a lot to me and I really appreciate it. And it's awesome to see some of the same names month after month, year after year. It really starts to feel like we're developing a relationship and I really appreciate chatting and hanging out with them in my art centric server, the Discord, ah, in my art centric Discord server, the paint box sorry so if you're looking for a friendly art community for artists of all ages and all skill abilities you're totally welcome to join my server i hope to see you guys there you'll find a link to that down in the description below as well if you are curious about more of my art in general i hope you guys will consider adding me on artfall instagram or checking out my work on artstation i'll have all of those linked down in the description as well so finally, once everything is finished and everything is dried, it's time to remove the blue tape, pulling away at a 90 degree angle. So if it does tear, it doesn't tear into the illustration itself. This is one of my favorite parts. It's so freeing, especially when you've really covered the page in paint. It's amazing to see how it compares against the white of the original paper. This one, not so much. We left a rim. We left a border around our circular illustration. So there was never like this huge reveal, but it's still really cool to be able to remove the blue tape. And that is it. That is another watercolor tutorial. If you guys ever have any questions about specific techniques, if you'd like to see me demonstrate specific things, I do a watercolor workshop every Friday night during my power hour live streams. And you guys are totally welcome to come. Please do. I'd love to hang out with you guys, chat with y'all and paint with y'all. You can also find more watercolor tutorials linked down in the description below. So thank you guys so much for watching. Have a wonderful day and huge thanks to these amazing patrons. Thank you guys so much. Your generosity makes tutorials like this one possible.